Hiri, Hiri, Hiri. The special session of the District Court of Ramsey County is now open pursuant to adjournment. The Honorable Leonardo Castro presiding. You may be seated. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Assistant Chief Judge Sarah Gruing and the judges and referees of the Second Judicial District in Ramsey County, I welcome you all to this special court session and thank you for attending. Last year at this event, I lamented that for the second year in a row, we were unable to meet in person. Although we are not quite exactly free from all danger, we are in a much better place. Gathering in person with caution allows us to welcome each other in a more personal and friendly manner whether it is a hug, a handshake, an elbow bump, a look in the eye, even from an acceptable distance, it allows us contact, something that our profession so desperately needs. The leadership at Ramsey County Bar Association fully understands the importance of this event and recognizes that this special session in honoring those who so graciously served as lawyers and judges in the service to others, to the public, in the protection of their rights. Those we remember today served in a variety of legal practices and judicial positions, but all worked to ensure that their clients and the public had access to the courts and would be heard without fear or favor, and ultimately achieve justice. These men and women we remember today were the conduit that accommodated the process. Each case was due. They are all worthy of our gratitude, praise, and respect. We as a profession have been in a strange place these past two years. In an effort to ensure that we continued access to the courts and due process, our profession modified the traditional idea of what it means to come to a court hearing. Technology allowed us to keep things moving by delivering services remotely. Much was achieved and much was learned. We worked like Marines. As we improvised, we adapted, and we overcame much of the obstacles that COVID brought our way. What we accomplished was necessary, and much of it is going to remain with us. But as I look out and see all these wonderful faces, I'm reminded that our profession is built and thrives on the relationships that we nourish. Lawyers must continue to be focused on building and maintaining that strong relationship with their clients, with their colleagues, with court clerks, with law clerks, and with their community, and accept that professionalism relies on our ability to connect with each other with that so-called human touch. The lawyers and judges we remember here today practice law and enforce the rule of law that affected the lives of so many people in a myriad of ways. They did not engage in abstract transactions or cases that needed to be resolved, but rather 
They engage in resolution of disputes that required facilitation, dialogue, and compassion. No matter where technology may take us, let us follow the example that came before us, a legacy of collegiality, of trust, and of respect. Let us continue to foster a human-centered approach to the practice of law. We honor those we have lost, support those that have suffered the lost, and share our memories so that we do not forget. To the families and friends and colleagues of those we remember today, I say we are sorry for your loss and wish you peace and that this memorial may bring you some comfort. And now I would like to pass it over to the Ramsey County Bar Association President, Ms. Monica Duner Lindgren. Thank you, Judge Castro. Good afternoon. May it please the court, your honors, fellow members of the bar, family and friends that are joining us in person and via live stream. On behalf of the entire Ramsey County Bar Association, thank you for joining us for the 2022 RCBA Memorials. Each year we gather to remember, celebrate, and honor the lives of lawyers, judges, and legal professionals that have dedicated themselves to the law. As we are reminded of the many contributions our colleagues have made to our profession and our communities, we are also often, we also learn about why they chose a legal career, but most importantly, what guided them in the pursuit of justice day after day. We are often drawn closer together as we hear our shared experiences. During these unprecedented times, this opportunity to gather as a community is especially meaningful. I hope that all of you are comforted in knowing that we support you and your grief and wish you peace. As we hear today's memorials, we are reminded of the words of the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Fight for the things you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. May we collectively continue to fight for the things that our colleagues and family cared about with their example as our guide. I would like to extend my gratitude to the co-hosts of the Memorials Committee, Scott Borchert and Betsy Keyes, along with the entire Memorials Committee. I would also like to thank the Tri-Bar staff who assisted in planning this event. I would also like to thank Hamlin University for extending this venue to us for today. We will go through today's memorials one by one in sequence and ask that you hold any applause to the end. The memorials will continue without introduction. At this time, I would like to ask, invite Judge Daly to come up for the first memorial. Good afternoon. It's my privilege to share with you a few memories of my friend, mentor, and law partner, Michael Bader, who died last November at age 68. A skilled and charismatic trial lawyer, Mike proudly and tenaciously represented the underdog against big insurance companies and corporations. Mike worked his way through the University of Minnesota and Hamlin Law School, bartending at fashionable restaurants and occasionally modeling. He was a handsome fellow with thick blonde hair and a strong profile. And we always thrilled to see 
Uh, we always thrilled at seeing his picture in a Dayton's ad. <laughs> he was definitely one of the cool crowd. Judges and juries liked him, and he quickly achieved success trying cases as a young lawyer. But it wasn't just charm that won cases over his 40-year career. He was also an excellent writer with a keen mind and a relentless work ethic. He tried big cases and got big verdicts in one long-fought battle for a burn victim on a case that twice went to the Court of Appeals. He secured a $3 million verdict. In addition to those big cases, he also loved taking on small cases that many lawyers wouldn't consider. He volunteered for many years at SMIRLS, Southern Minnesota Regional Legal Services, which provides free legal help to low-income Minnesotans. I remember one elderly woman's case he pursued that was especially difficult. Mike took it on with gusto and achieved a great result. His client was so pleased she regularly brought pans of brownies to our office for years. He relished connecting with people and bringing justice to the disadvantaged. It was why he loved practicing law. Mike was a loyal and devoted friend. He genuinely cared about his friends and made them a priority in his life. He was even more devoted to his family. He is survived by his wife, Michelle, his high school sweetheart. He doted on his four children. He was a great raconteur, often came to the office with a fun story about a son or daughter's latest adventure. You could tell how proud he was of all of them. No one could tell a story like Mike. There was the time his leg fell asleep during a jury trial and he stood up only to fall flat on his face in front of the jury. Or his chaotic trip to St. Paul's Fun Fair with his children, he couldn't convince them to get off a ride and finally realized that if he just pointed to the next ride, they would run to it. <laughs> In his hands, a story charmed and captivated and always made you laugh. There was something special about Mike, Chariz charismatic and charming for sure, but something more. He had such personal magnetism. When he turned his attention to you with those bright eyes and that thousand watt smile, you felt alive and energized. He was a remarkable fellow and will be dearly missed. I'm here to honor William David Bauer. Bill Bauer was born in Iowa on July 6, 1946, and passed away peacefully on September 27, 2021. He was a lifelong learner, an active outdoorsman, a silent sports athlete, a devoted husband, father, and grandfather, an enthusiastic and dedicated friend, a creative and business-oriented attorney, a mentor, and a role model. He was also my father. He lived in North Oaks, Minnesota in Cable, Wisconsin, near the starting line for the American Berkebiner Cross Country Ski Marathon. He completed this marathon 30 times, earning in the process the high status of birch legger and uber legger. He loved cross country skiing, the time in the woods without insects, the athleticism and beauty of the sport, and many close friendships with fellow skiers. This race and other marathons he completed tell us so much about my father. His endurance, his energy, his passion, his persistence, which he exercised unselfishly throughout his life on behalf of others. He made cross-country skiing a social and contagious activity, inviting others to participate, organizing active and social weekends with groups of friends, and creating traditions with so many family members and friends through participation in the sport. It made him truly smile to open the family cabin in Cable, Wisconsin to host others, to watch loved ones participate in the sport that he loved. He also completed running marathons and half marathons, as well as endurance mountain and road biking events. My father practiced law for 40 years, focused on intellectual property law and especially patent law at Unisys, 3M, Amation, and IPLM, 
a firm he founded with two friends, Mike Mao and Dave Cleveland. He mentored many lawyers early in their career, several of whom used his instruction and encouragement to start successful IP law firms or move into leading management positions as inside counsel. As an attorney, he was a zealous advocate, but he also practiced with modesty, allowing his clients to take credit for successes largely due to his efforts. Some of the best work that lawyers do is known only to a few people. In the case of patent lawyers, the right to practice, essentially the right to stay in business for a particular product line, can be established by the leverage obtained with patent applications and by designing around competing patents, frequently coupled with cross-licenses and other agreements. When successful, the result may be a grown business without patent litigation and without resulting headlines. Steve Bauer, his friend, colleague, and client, who saw my father both from the perspective of a junior attorney to a mentor and as a client, tells me that my father excelled at this. My father also employed his legal and technical skills to serve the community. For example, he was one of the original commissioners on the North Suburban Cable Commission, serving 10 years from 1979 to 1989. At the same time, nothing surpassed his love of his family. He was a devoted husband to the love of his life, Beverly. Married for 54 years after meeting in high school, their special relationship was a role model to many. He was a true partner to my mother, sharing in household chores and life's obligations, while also encouraging her to pursue her own experiences and own successes. He supported her to start her own business in Cable, Wisconsin called Redberry Books, and he worked enthusiastically in and for the store by her side. He was a devoted father to his children, my brother Matt Bauer and myself, a devoted grandfather to his grandchildren, Kiara and Elliot. While growing up, despite having a busy career, he always managed to attend our events, sports activities, and milestones. My dad also inspired me to pursue the legal profession. Long before law school, I learned from him the nobility of the profession and the ability of attorneys to assist the lives of others. I often set, sought career and business advice from him throughout my adult life. He always helped me to evaluate my thoughts, however, never told me what to do or expressed judgment about my decisions, and he supported me without condition. When I passed the bar and was admitted to practice, my dad was by my side, serving as a vouching attorney at my swearing-in ceremony. He was always there throughout the big and small moments of my life. My father also continued to develop himself outside of his profession through hobbies, learning, and travel throughout his life. He dedicated himself to learning photography, created many books from his travels and events with short narratives, which were printed and bound and shared with friends and family. In the summer before his death, he was able to have a bucket list experience by spending the day taking pictures on the ocean in Maine with one of his favorite photographers, along with my mother, and spending the, day, the next day with him developing the photographs they took. He enjoyed the experience of many different countries, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Japan, Colombia, Peru, and New Zealand being a few examples. Many of these trips were made with my mother and with other friends. However, he traveled to Iceland and Peru on his own to take pictures. He encouraged, inspired independence and a zest for life in those around him, including myself. His often repeated motto, choose joy, will live on as a reminder to us all. Let me end with the wish that my father used to close emails and letters. Think snow. May it please the court. I am Eric Larson. You now the program indicates that for Elizabeth Carlson, the presenter will be Leanne Clayton. Uh, Leanne, unfortunately, regrettably, uh, is unable to make it today. But I have the honor that she asked me to present the memorial in memory of Elizabeth Carlson. Elizabeth Carlson, as well as Leanne, uh, were classmates of mine at. Uh, then known as William Mitchell College of Law, now as Mitchell Hamlin. In memory of Elizabeth J. Carlson, born in Minneapolis to John and Patricia Carlson, Liz was the oldest of four sisters, Cynthia, Susan, and Jennifer. She graduated from Detroit Lake Senior High, where she ran cross country with the boys, 
when there was no girls team. She could debate both sides of an issue like switching from piano to the string bass. Her road to the law passed through Gustavus Adolphus, where she had the opportunity to, opportunity to study abroad in Yugoslavia. There she lear learned Croatian along with the realities of totalitarianism under Tito. Upon her return, she pursued a bachelor's degree at the University of Minnesota, choosing Ojibwe as her next foreign language. In addition to her studies, she worked at group homes for the developmentally disabled. This experience would inform her life as well as her legal career. Pursuant to the Welsh Consent Decree, the state began to transition from hospital to less restrictive community settings. Liz found work in the office of Welsh Court Monitor Richard Cohen. She became a volunteer advocate through ARC, A-R-C, where she met Gordy Parkhurst, an Oneida citizen born with cerebral palsy and deaf. Misdiagnosed and institutionalized at Faribault State Hospital as an infant, Liz taught him to sign his first language experience. Her advocacy for Gordy brought her in collaboration with pro bono attorneys Wright Walling and Lynn Youth. Luther Granquist at Legal Aid and Alan Listiak, a psychologist in the Department of Corrections. These experience, experiences shaped much of what Liz was about and led, to her, led her to graduate with honors from William Mitchell College of Law in 1992. After law school, she served as a law clerk to the Honorable Philip D. Bush, an assistant public defender in Anoka before establishing Carlson Family Law Office, LLC, in 1995. She continued her volunteer work at Chrysalis Women's Center, the Bar Association, and Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers. More, more recently, Liz was a document review attorney and was in the process of becoming licensed alcohol and drug counselor at Century College when her life was cut short by an aggressive cancer. Liz loved to watch things grow. This was evident in her many gardens and her diverse social and professional circle. Above all, her most cherished role was as a mother to Hunter and Cameron Frank. Liz is deeply missed. Respectfully submitted by Leanne Clayton and Don Frank. I also have the honor of presenting in memory of the Honorable Manuel Jesus Cervantes. Manuel Jesus Cervantes was born on February 1st, 1951 in Albert Lee, Minnesota. The son of Maria del Carmen Cervantes and Elidio R. Cervantes. When Manuel was 10 years old, his father died. Manuel stepped into the role of helping his mother and six younger siblings navigate life in St. Paul. His mother, Carmen Cervantes, spoke limited English, and Manuel became the family's point person, such as scheduling doctor's appointments and waking early to deliver the newspaper to make extra money for the family. His brother, Ricardo Cervantes, noted, he led the family when we needed him most. After graduating from St. Paul's Harding High School, Manuel went on to become the first person in his family to enter college, McAllister College, in 1974. And all of his siblings followed his example. Like him, graduating from McAllister College and building successful careers. After graduating from McAllister, Manuel worked as a paralegal for the Neighborhood Justice Center. Neighborhood Justice Center staff encouraged him to go to law school, and he did. Graduating from the University of Minnesota Law School in 1980, Manuel then became an attorney for the AFL-CIO. In 1986, Governor Rudy Perpich appointed him to be a judge in the Minnesota Workers' Compensation Court of Appeals. 
the first Latino person in that role. Four years later, Patricia and Manuel married in 1990. From 1992 to 2002, Manuel served as a Ramsey County District Court referee, presiding over cases in family, juvenile, and domestic abuse court. From 2002 through 2006, Manuel was the city attorney for the city of St. Paul. And thereafter, a senior assistant attorney with the Minnesota Attorney General's Office and a Minnesota Administrative Law Judge. In 2013, Governor Mark Dayton appointed Manuel Cervantes to the, workers to the Minnesota Workers' Compensation Court of Appeals, where he served until his retirement on February 1, 2018, after his cancer diagnosis. His daughter, Sebastinia Cervantes, noted, he was strong in his work ethic, and he was strong in his fight. He did not want to give up. The doctors first gave him six to eight months, and he lived for more than three years after his diagnosis. Judge Cervantes enjoyed soccer, having played on the McAllister College soccer team and played well into his 60s. He served as a youth soccer coach and mentor to youth at Humboldt High School. He was an avid motorcyclist who regularly went on cross-country trips with his brother Juan and friends. He would often swim a mile during his lunch break at the McAllister Pool. In 2004, Manuel invited us to join his rag team, team soccer team that he assembled each year for the annual Ancient Ranger, Ranger Soccer Tournament. It was one of the more diverse teams on the field. Many different native languages, ethnic origins, religious backgrounds and belief, and a wide spectrum of white and blue collar jobs were represented. Judge Cervantes assembled this team. He knew us all, enjoyed our company, and by natural extension, we too enjoyed each other's company. Judge Cervantes loved people regardless of background and his smile. Genuine interest and joyful voice and demeanor endeared him to all who met him. Judge Cervantes was a very learned and experienced attorney and jurist, but probably his most outstanding attribute was his genuine interest and the people before him. One time while Judge Cervantes was with his family listening to music at Mears Park, a man approached him and said, you're Judge Cervantes, shook his hand and thanked him. Although the man had lost his case, he said that the judge was the only person who had ever taken the time to listen to his story. Retired Ramsey County District Court Judge Salvador Rosa said of Judge Cervantes, he and his family are a remarkable example of hard work and perseverance, and his family story should serve as a real source of inspiration for our community. In 2018, Judge Manuel Cervantes received the Minnesota State Bar Association's Rosalie, a. Rosalie E. Wall Judicial Award of Excellence for his outstanding career for improving the quality of justice in the state of Minnesota. In 2022, the Minnesota Hispanic Bar Association renamed its endowment fund to the Manuel Cervantes Endowment Fund Award. Judge Manuel Cervantes lost his cancer battle on March 31, 2021. He died at home in St. Paul, surrounded by his family. He is survived by his wife, Patricia, children, Karina, Craig, Jeff Craig, Nicole Herman, Manuel Jose Cervantes, and Sebastina Cervantes, 11 grandchildren and one great-grandchild. And his siblings, Raquel Cervantes, Bethke, Ramona Cervantes, Jose Cervantes, Guadalupe Cervantes, Juan Cervantes, and Ricardo Cervantes. Respectfully submitted by Eric Larson and referee James Street. May it please the court. My name is Steve Lokensgard, and it's with great pleasure I uh, provide a memorial for John Cieslak. Lieutenant Colonel John Cieslak passed away October 11th, 2021, at the age of 72. John was a gentleman and a scholar. 
John was born in Minneapolis and raised in St. Louis Park by parents Evelyn Cieslak Nahersky and Edwin Cieslak, and later his stepfather, Francis Nahersky, who was a St. Paul attorney. John excelled in school, graduating from Benilde High School. He attended Princeton University on an Army ROTC scholarship and graduated in 1971. Last year, John wrote an article for Princeton's 50th reunion yearbook where he talked about his experience in ROTC at Princeton. He noted that his father died when he was young and his mother suffered from a lengthy illness and that he would not have been able to go to Princeton without the Army scholarship. He noted that at other schools like Harvard and Yale at the time, ROTC students were not wearing uniforms on campus because they were taunted and made to feel uncomfortable, but he was never taunted at Princeton while wearing his uniform. Upon graduating, John was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the field artillery, and he later served in the Adjutant General's Corps. To his surprise, instead of getting orders for Vietnam, he was sent to Germany where he served at Wertheim and later Berlin. John studied law at Lewis and Clark Law School and after graduating was appointed to the Judge Advocate General's Corps. Although his ROTC commitment was four years, John ended up serving 23 years in the Army. John's last assignment in the Army as, was as the full-time legal advisor to the Adjutant General of, of the State of Minnesota. The Adjutant General is in charge of the Department of Military Affairs and the Minnesota National Guard when they are in state service. For most of his time in the Guard, John was the only full-time judge advocate. Today there are four. As the sole full-time legal advisor, John was effectively general counsel for the Guard. He advised the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Minnesota Attorney General's Office on litigation involving the Guard. He helped individual Guard members with their personal legal issues, he advised commanders on personnel actions as well as the use of force. He was a trusted advisor on the general staff and was known not only for his sage advice, but his calming demeanor. John was known by other judge advocates as being incredibly smart and thoughtful, a tremendous mentor and supporter, and a great friend and colleague. During one of the last quasi-guard events John attended with other retired judge advocates, in the absence of any formal ceremony, John nevertheless took the time to remark about how special it was for him to get together with his former colleagues. And he, heard, he urged all of us to recognize how special that event was for each of us. He cherished the camaraderie that the Army is known for. And he remarked in his Princeton article that the Army was like a movable feast. You move from post to post, but at each place you'll likely run into somebody you know. John was also a strong advocate for history, tradition, and remembering those who had gone on before us. John was the major organizing spirit behind the VEV, the VEVJ Day dinner, the last 20 years or so. His official title was Co-Perpetual Secretary Pro Tem. Since, <laughs> since 1943, the VEVJ Day has met once a year to remember the victory in Europe and the victory in Japan with a dinner followed by prognostication. John wrote inserts to the program about Minnesota attorneys and judges who served in World War II, honoring their service and their memory. John would exalt the old days when Mike Galvin Sr., Mike Galvin, or Gary Flackney would tell long, elaborate jokes at the VEVJ Day dinner, which would culminate in a memorable punchline. He loved providing a venue for the bench and the bar to gather each year in a spirit of collegiality and have a couple drinks and many laughs. John's storytelling ability was unparalleled, and his joy in telling them was palpable. But they weren't just stories the kind you made up. They were a series of very detailed facts that were meticulously stored in his brain and unlocked whenever he had an audience or at least one interested party willing to listen. <laughs> one thing that always struck me as he was telling a story was his incredible detail about people that stuck with him. He would be talking about a legal case, mention the attorney making the argument, 
Then he would start talking about the attorney's secretary and who she was married to, and then he'd get back on track and finish talking about the case. His detailed memory of people and names and how they were connected to history was truly fascinating. It demonstrated to me not only a vibrant mind, but a person who was genuinely interested in and cared for all kinds of people, not just the power brokers, but everybody that had a part to play in the story. John was an exemplary, extremely active, and contributing member of our community. He finished his professional career as the Vice President of Development for the Minnesota Zoo, a position that played on his strength of connecting with people and advocating for a worthy cause. And in addition to the VEVJ Day Club, he was active in a variety of civic organizations, including the Boy Scouts, the Rotary Club, the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, the Minnesota Military Museum, and the Ramsey County Bar Association. He was a true citizen soldier. John married his wife, Anne, four days after graduating from Princeton, and they celebrated their 50th anniversary just last year. He and Anne have five children, five grandchildren. He's also survived by his br brother, Paul Nahersky. John will be greatly missed by his friends, family, military colleagues, and members of the VEVJ Day Club. Respectfully submitted by Steve Lokensgaard and Ann Sieslack. May it please the court. I'm Elizabeth Keyes, and I have the honor today to present this memorial for Robert Thomas Dolan. Most people knew him as Bob. Bob was born on September 22nd in 1947, and he died on November 8th, 2021. Bob was an outstanding attorney. He was a trial attorney. He loved to go to trial. Bob's intelligence, compassion, empathy, and his um, sense of humor fared him well. He identified with the jury, and the jury identified with him. He gave every client 100% of himself. Bob's greatest quality was his integrity. He never, ever compromised his integrity. Bob was so much more than being an outstanding attorney. His first love was his family. He was involved in coaching the kids' teams. He made it fun. He was present at every game if he was in town. He was a resource they could bounce ideas off of as they grew. He was involved in every aspect of their lives. Following his daughter Megan's death, who was a quadriplegic, following an accident, he became involved in Camp Courage. He lived there every summer doing whatever needed to be done. He did personal cares, feeding those who couldn't feed themselves, driving a boat so they could enjoy tubing. He was their rock when zip lining through the air. Bob loved them and they loved Bob. He had a special kind of humor that made them laugh. He lived for Camp Courage. He served meals at Sharing and Caring Hands he volunteered to coach wheelchair basketball, and there he was at the Paralympics tryouts. In addition to his volunteering, he was on the mixed, excuse me, he was on the boxing commission, which also oversaw mixed martial arts. He wanted to make sure things were as safe as possible. Bob did all these things with such love. He did things in a quiet way. He never bragged about what he did. To put a smile on your face was enough for Bob. If you had the honor to meet Bob, you knew he was special. He made everyone feel that they had value. To sum it up best, heaven needed a hero, and they got Bob, a true hero to mankind. Respectfully submitted, Gene Dolan.
May it please the court. My name is Scott Borkert and I'm here today for the honor of uh, presenting a memorial on behalf of Timothy J. Dwyer. Timothy J. Dwyer was born November 8th, 1947 and left us too soon on May 14th, 2021. He graduated from Washburn High School in Minneapolis. He attended Minnesota State University, Mankato, Mankato State, and received his Bachelor's of Science degree in Accounting and Economics. He started his postgraduate career at the CPA firm of Touche, Ross, Bailey, and Smart. He received his law degree from William Mitchell College of Law. While a law student, he was hired as a law clerk by James E. Kelly, a benefactor and member of the board of directors at William Mitchell. After graduating, he joined the law firm of Kelly and O'Neill, and through his legal career, had the privilege of practicing with James C. O'Neill. He passed the CPA exam after graduating from law school, and throughout his career, he used his expertise in accounting to facilitate his practice of law. As a young lawyer, he helped in juvenile court and over the years did pro bono work for several nonprofits, including women's advocates. He taught accounting and business law at St. Thomas University's Evening Business School. He loved his time as a college instructor, but could no longer maintain the schedule with his growing legal practice. For several years, he also worked as an adjunct professor at William Mitchell and served as a referee for American arbitration. In his later years, Tim served as president of Markham Company of St. Paul. He was president of Kelly and O'Neill Management Company and served as a treasurer and board member for the Kelly Foundation. Though Tim loved the practice of law, his first dedication was to his family. His four children were his pride and joy. Over the years, he enjoyed lifelong friendships with college and law school colleagues. Sports played a significant role in his life, and he was an avid tennis and racquetball player, golfer, and completed several rollerblade marathons. He was a lover of science and history and was known for always having a book in his hand. Tim is missed by his family and all his friends and colleagues who he developed lifelong relationships with over the years. And if I could be afforded a, a short personal note, I had the uh, honor of uh, being a student uh, attorney for the uh, Ramsey County um, Attorney's Office years ago. And uh, I worked in the juvenile court and uh, I would run into Tim occasionally and he was always very helpful. He always took the time to discuss with me court process and the finer details of the practice of law of which I was very grateful. Respectfully submitted by Mary Dwyer. May it please the court, my name is Gail Chang Bohr, and it is my honor to give this memorial for Linda Gallant, who was born June 6th, 1946, and died June 13th, 2021. Student activist, activist lawyer, law school professor, and Hennepin County District Court referee, Linda Gallant died on June 13th, 2021, only four months after being diagnosed with lymphoma and just one week after celebrating her 75th birthday at her home with her many friends. 
Linda was born and raised near Boston, Massachusetts with her older sister and two younger brothers. After graduating high school, Linda attended Pembroke College, part of Brown University, in Providence, Rhode Island, where she became active in the anti-war and civil rights movements. Linda helped organize the Brown University contingent of the 1967 Pentagon sit-in in, in protest of the Vietnam War where she was among the many protesters arrested. In 1968, in the aftermath of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. assassination, Linda helped organize a sit-in at the Rhode Island State House in support of fair housing legislation. In 1968, after graduating from Brown, Linda moved to Minneapolis, where she taught at City Inc. in North Minneapolis. In 1973, after the American Indian Movement occupation of Wounded Knee, South Dakota, Linda volunteered to do legal support work on the criminal cases arising from the occupation. The following year, 1974, Linda enrolled at William Mitchell College of Law. While in law school, Linda worked as a law clerk for the Legal Rights Center in South Minneapolis. Upon graduating law school in 1977, Linda opened her own law practice, serving largely poor and working class clients. Her social activism continued, representing tenants on rent strikes seeking better housing conditions and peace and justice activists protesting a local company's manufacturing of cluster bombs. In 1986, Linda left private practice to serve as a clinical professor, both at William Mitchell and in New York City. In 1993, Linda was chosen to serve as a Hennepin County District Court referee, a position she held until her retirement in 2012. In her retirement, Linda became an active adventurer, hiker, bicyclist, canoeist, and kayaker. She traveled the world, China, biking, Mongolia, Russia, Cambodia, France, Thailand, Hong Kong, Singapore, Machu Picchu, hiking, Cuba, biking, Vietnam, Croatia, biking, Jordan, biking to Petra, Nepal, Turkey, Greece, Morocco, and her favorite, Italy. Her travels included hiking the arduous Great Wall of China, as well as biking Prince Edward Island in search of gallant ancestors. Linda is survived by her, by her three siblings, her aunt, and her many nieces, nephews, grandnieces and grandnephews. To many, Linda may be most remembered as a community builder, the one who would gather neighbors and longtime community activists to her backyard to celebrate the coming of spring, Galan's Margarita opener. Uh, this was respectfully submitted by the Honorable Mark Wernick who wrote the memorial. And Linda Gallant was my legal writing teacher. Good afternoon, Chief Judge Castro, members of the court, colleagues, friends. I'm here to speak on behalf of David Fulton Herr. I'm Eric Magnuson. David was born on July 13, 1950, 
He passed away from ALS on December 22, 2021. Few members of our profession have had a greater impact on the bench and bar of our state than David Herr. His passing was unexpected and will leave a huge void in our profession. David was born in St. Paul. He attended Linwood Park School, St. Paul Academy, and graduated from Camarillo, California High School in 1968. He received a BA in geology, English, and political science. It's quite a mix. Uh, and an MBA in finance from the U University of Colorado at Boulder before relocating in St. Paul to attend law school at William Mitchell, now Mitchell Hamlin, School of Law. He graduated with a JD cum laude in 1978. David clerked in Minnesota District Court during law school and then began his career with the Minneapolis office of Robbins Kaplan. In 1981, he began his 40-year association with the Maslin firm in Minneapolis in their litigation group, where he became a highly regarded appellate lawyer, complex case litigator, and managing partner all at the same time. He regularly argued cases in the Minnesota and federal appellate courts. But beyond being a skilled advocate uh, and highly regarded one, David had a lifelong commitment to giving back to the profession. He was an adjunct professor at Mitchell for more than 30 years. He was perhaps the most prolific author of his generation in Minnesota, writing textbooks on Minnesota and federal law. He authored several editions of the Annotated Manual for Complex Litigation, the Multidistrict Litigation Manual Practice Before the Judicial Panel, on multi-district litigation, both published by Thompson West. He co-authored Minnesota Practice Appellate Rules Annotated, which is the leading treatise on Minnesota appellate law. He co-authored the Minnesota Appellate Practice Summary Guide, the Minnesota Evidence Rules Summary Guide for Minnesota CLE. He was the original 1984 author and editor and subsequently continued to edit several editions of the Eighth Circuit Appellate's Practice Manual. He co-authored the Summary of Eighth Circuit Appellate Procedure for Minnesota CLE. He was the co-author of Federal Appeals, Jurisdiction and Practice, also published by Thompson West. He wrote Learning Civil Procedure, part of the learning uh, series that West published for law schools. Uh, his most recent publication, completed shortly after his diagnosis with ALS and issued just last year, was Elements of an Action. Published by Thompson Reuters, it is a comprehensive 2,400-page work outlining the elements of hundreds of causes of action ranging from abuse of process to wrongful death with specimen pleadings and annotated resource citations. I picked it up, it made me tired. <laughs> His contributions to the bench and bar went even further, however. For a decade, he served, or for decades, he served as a reporter to a variety of state rules committees, helping shepherd through uh, the sometimes challenging rulemaking process, significant amendments and improvements to the legal system. No one contributed more to the improvement of the civil justice system than did David. His service included the Minnesota Supreme Court Advisory Committee, Rules of Civil Procedure, where he served as reporter since 1983, the Uniform Local Rules, where he served as reporter from 1989 to 1992, the General Rules of Practice, where he served as the reporter since 1992, and the Civil Appellate Procedure co-reporter since 1996. David's accomplishments were recognized not only locally but nationally. He was a fellow in the American Academy of Appellate Lawyers, an invitation-only organization comprised of the 400 top appellate lawyers in the country. David was the president of that organization. He also served as a charter member and president of the Academy of Court-Appointed Masters. David also demonstrated an enduring commitment to justice and community service through pro bono work and volunteer work. He co-founded and served on the board of the Minnesota Supreme Court Historical Society, chaired the United Hospital Foundation Board, 
and served on the board of directors of the Innocence Project of Minnesota and the U.S. Fencing Association. On December 3rd, 2021, David was honored at a Lifetime Achievement Celebration that cited his professionalism, his visionary leadership, his love of appellate work, and his generous mentoring of students and young lawyers. At that ceremony, Governor Tim Walls recognized his accomplishments, and Mayor Melvin Carter proclaimed December 3, 2021, as David F. Her Day in the city of St. Paul. On a personal note, David was my close friend and collaborator for more than 40 years. We wrote books together, we taught together, we had cases with and against one another. You could not ask for a better adversary or friend than David. At all times, he was a gentleman, a skilled and determined advocate, a thoughtful counselor, a superb writer. Uh, he was the ideal teammate. Above all, David was a devoted husband, father, and grandfather. He is survived by his wife of 35 years, Mary Kay Herr. Mary Kay couldn't be here today because she was uh, tested positive for COVID. And while she feels well, she didn't want to expose any of you to that disease. He's also survived by his sons Alec Herr and Erlen Truitt, grandsons Reyes and Novick, siblings Andrew Fulton Herr, Barbara Herr Hawthorne, Susan Herr Hopwood, and countless in-laws, nieces, and nephews. He and his wife Mary Kay took great joy in family and friends, all of whom will miss him greatly. David was a lifelong member of St. Paul's House of Hope Presbyterian Church. Respectfully submitted, Eric Magnuson. May it please the court. The uh, city of White Bear Lake lost their community lawyer with the passing of Richard C. Heinecker. Dick's journey began in Lesur, Minnesota as the son of a small town doctor. He often spoke of the good fortune he had in growing up in a small community and going on to raise his family and pursue his career in a similar setting. His early life foreshadowed the success he would have in later years. He was both an Eagle Scout and a valedictorian of his high school class in 1951. Dick attended Minnesota's St. John's University for one year and then enlisted in the U.S. Army, spending two years in Germany. He went on to complete his undergraduate education and earned his law degree at the University of Minnesota, where he met and married Elizabeth. By the time Dick graduated from law school, he and Elizabeth had three of their five children. Their marriage of nearly 62 years was filled with love for each other and their family and with a deep devotion to the Catholic faith. In 1962, Dick and Elizabeth moved to White Bear Lake with their family, where he began the practice of law partnering with James A. Meyer. The legal needs of the growing community were such that Dick practiced in a variety of legal areas, including real estate, probate, estate planning, divorce, criminal law, and civil litigation. Dick spent uh, many hours, also spent many hours representing clients regarding land use issues in White Bear Lake and adjoining communities. And before title insurance companies became commonplace, Dick attained great expertise in the examination of title records. He frequently visited the Ramsey County Abstract Office to carefully examine original documents, and his desk was always stacked high with ancient abstracts that required his expert attention. Dick was highly respected as a legal advocate who was both honest and well-prepared. Whether advocating for clients in a courtroom speaking at crowded public meetings or conferring in smaller settings, 
his strong voice and articulate presentation gathered the attention of all. Not one to obscure the issues, Dick made straightforward, factual presentations that were respected by those on each side of an argument. In addition to James Meyer and Dick, the law firm eventually included attorneys Jerome Filla and myself, Michael Fleming. To his younger partners, Dick proved an exemplary mentor, often reminding them to provide good services to all clients while equally cherishing time spent with family. It was a collegial group, and all partners remember that their time together was a time when it was both rewarding and an honor to practice law. Dick finished his legal career as corporate counsel for his longtime client, Towsley Ford, and he retired in 2001 after 40 years of providing legal services to his community. Throughout his career, Dick volunteered much of his time to using his talents for the betterment of the community. With all five of his children in the White Bear Lake schools, Dick served on the District 624 school board for many years. He was also very active in the DFL party, frequently serving as moderator and parliamentarian at local DFL conventions. In addition, thanks to Dick's efforts, ownership of the historic and picturesque Philip Brown House was transferred to the White Bear Lake Historical Society. And he was a prime advocate for a scenic one-way avenue which was created along the city's lakeshore, a resource popular with walkers and bikers from around the community. Dick also provided his legal skills to local community and nonprofit corporations, his church, and individual clients who could not afford legal services. His deep sense of humility was evident to all those who knew him well. He rarely spoke of his contributions to the community or his, ses or his successes in the practice of law. Richard Heinecker's legacy is marked by devotion to family, skillful and thoughtful practice of law, and service to his White Bear Lake community. May it please the court, members of the bar, and the public. My name is Michael Streeter, and I'm here to present a memorial on behalf of Sarge Kyle. Richard H. Kyle, known to all as Sarge, died on June 22, 2021, at the age of 84. He was born in St. Paul and was a lifelong resident of White Bear Lake, Minnesota. He earned a BA with honors from the University of Minnesota and an LLB from the University of Minnesota Law School, where he served as the president of the Minnesota Law Review and was a member of Order of the Coif. After graduation, he served as a law clerk to the Honorable Edward J. Devitt, longtime chief judge of the United States District Court for the District of Minnesota. Sarge joined the law firm of Briggs and Morgan after his clerkship, only leaving the firm to serve as Minnesota's Solicitor General from 1968 to 1970, and finally in 1992, when he was appointed to the federal bench by President George H.W. Bush. Though a lifelong Republican, his appointment was facilitated by the strong endorsement not only of then Minnesota Republican Senator David Dernberger, but also of then former Democratic Senator Walter Mondale and former Democratic Attorney General Warren Spanhus. Appropriately for today's event, the call from President Bush to inform Sarge of his appointment came while Sarge was trying a case before the Ramsey County bench, Judge Jerome Plunkett, who graciously granted a brief recess so that Sarge could take the call in the judge's chambers. This is likely the only call to the Ramsey County District Court where the operator announced the President of the United States is on the line. 
One of the challenges he faced when he became a lawyer at Briggs and Morgan was a large shadow cast by his father, Richard E. Kyle, a World War II veteran from the greatest generation, a nationally recognized trial lawyer at Briggs and Morgan, a leader in the bar in the selection of federal judges, and a legendary raconteur, a larger than life figure who was affectionately called the general. The younger Kyle joined the firm and quickly took on the nickname Sarge. The challenge was how to be his own man and create his own career. This he did with wonderful grace. One could say that he never aspired to become the general, but his humble style meant that he was content to be Sarge. He blazed his own path trying many significant cases and as Solicitor General of Minnesota, an officer of First Trust Company, and as President of the Minnesota Board of Law Examiners. And finally, he became an outstanding federal judge, one which his father would have been so proud of had he lived to see the day. Judge Kyle served on the District of Minnesota bench for nearly 30 years, during which time he endeavored to live up to Judge Devitt's Ten Commandments for the new judge, the first of which is to possess a kind and understanding heart. Judge Kyle was justifiably famous among federal practitioners in Minnesota for taking to heart the maxim, early to bed, early to rise, a practice he first honed at the firm. He arrived so early on his first day as a federal judge that the courthouse was still locked tight. After that, he was given his own key to the building. His work ethic was legendary. He was in his chambers well before 6 a.m., six days a week. He scheduled hearings at 8 a.m. and would often start those hearings a few minutes early. And though his expectations for lawyers were high, his standards for his own work were even higher. Judge Kyle was a consummate trial judge. He enjoyed trying cases as a litigator, and that experience served him well on the bench. He presided over many high-profile cases and was well-respected by the bar and his colleagues for his handling of them. As numerous lawyers and colleagues said, quote, I can't even begin to compete with the example he set on so many levels, end quote. Quote, I can't even begin, oh, sorry, quote, he was a class act in every way, end quote. He was, quote, a wonderful role model for the entire legal community, end quote, and was indisputably one of the leaders on the federal bench. He performed his job with grace and humility, always cognizant of the awesome power he wielded simply with his pen, and with absolute respect for all parties who sought justice in his courtroom. Sarge married the former Jane Foley in 1959. Together, he and Jane had five wonderful children, the Honorable Richard Kyle, Jr., Michael Kyle, Darcy Kyle, Patrick Kyle, and the Reverend Kathleen Briscoe. The family now includes 10 grandchildren and one great-grandchild. Judge Kyle fostered a family atmosphere in Chambers, maintaining relationships with his long, law clerks long after they left his employ and holding a Chambers reunion each summer at the family Kyle home in White Bear Lake. He was a wonderful mentor to his clerks and others in the federal family, whether offering, as one former probation officer said, quote, guidance and support during some challenging and joyous professional times, end quote, or a comforting presence during illness or difficult moments. As more than one clerk stated, he taught me how to be a better human. In addition to his judicial work, Judge Kyle served on numerous law-related committees. His favorite assignment, as evidenced by the yellow hard hat in his chambers, was overseeing the extensive three-year renovation of the Warren E. Berger United States Courthouse and Federal Building in St. Paul. In closing, a former law clerk's observation reveals the character of the man we called Sarge. Quote, at the end of Judge Kyle's funeral service, we clerks lined the aisle at St. Mark's Cathedral as his family carried his ashes out the door. It was impossible to think that this giant of a person could be in that little box. But of course, he wasn't. You could see him all over the faces of his family. And for us, the clerks, 
His way of thinking is so ingrained and we channeled him for so long that it is impossible to know where he ends and we begin." End quote. Respectfully submitted by Mark Patinsky, David Greening, the Honorable Sam Hansen, the Honorable Richard Kyle, Anita Terry, and myself, Michael Streeter. May it please the court. I'm Kelly Lawton Rogoszewski, presenting a memorial for my father, Robert J. Lawton, Sr. He was born on August 30th of 1950 and passed away on July 20th of 2021. Robert J. Lawton, Sr. was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1950. He moved to St. Paul, Minnesota in the fourth grade when his father accepted a position as a professor of child psychiatry at the University of Minnesota. He attended St. Thomas Academy and the University of St. Thomas before graduating in the first class of Hamlin University School of Law, now Mitchell Hamlin. He started his own practice in the fall of 1976 and maintained it until the very end, appearing in court via Zoom just days before he passed away. He shared office space for decades with his brother Jim, practicing in the labor building at 411 Main Street in downtown St. Paul before moving in the 1990s to the building on West 7th Street that Bob Brealey made his own. Bob practiced in the areas of family law, criminal law, and child protection, and he valued accountability and personal responsibility. He had a strong dislike of bullies and abuse of power and authority. He had a special affinity for outsiders and underdogs. Grumble though he might, Bob thoroughly enjoyed his work as a public defender. He cultivated a gruff exterior, but had a warm heart, and when he cared for people, he cared deeply. He enjoyed bringing people together, and along with his wife, Roxanne, hosted legendary Halloween and Christmas parties. He had a strong sense of mischief and loved playing April Fool's jokes on colleagues. The Rocky Mountains, the Black Hills, and the Southwest all held special places in his heart, and his home and office were decorated with rocks, artwork, and plants reflecting those. He tended with care to hundreds of bonsai and cactus plants and gave them as gifts to friends. He was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in July of 2020 and was told he had weeks to months to live. True to form, he defied expectations, living nearly another full year. He truly savored the additional time with friends and loved ones. He was moved by the outpouring of support he received from colleagues and I'm so grateful for the same. Respectfully submitted by Kelly Lawton Rogoszewski. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andy Dawkins, Andrew Dawkins, and I've asked attorney Richard Bowen to join me up here. The three of us, uh, Phil Leavenworth, Rick Bowen, Andy Dawkins, shared a law office on University Avenue uh, for almost 30 years. I may please the court. Uh, it's an honor to be here to talk about Phil Leavenworth. He was born on January 26, 1956, died at age 65 on March 17, 2021. We knew, him, we knew him well, Rick and I. Phil uh, was licensed to practice in Minnesota in 1990. He worked as a criminal defense lawyer for the next three decades. He was an ethical, well-respected attorney who was dedicated to his work and committed to his clients. Phil was also a loving, caring, and compassionate husband to Fong Bowie. They were together for almost 30 years. He was born January 26, 1956, graduated high school in Chicago, lived in Colorado, eventually moved to St. Paul to continue his education. Received his law degree from the William Mitchell College of Law, where he was an editor on the William Mitchell Law Review. His classmate and fellow law review editor, Randy Tejan, recalls, quote, Phil was a, a quiet, respectful, and intelligent man, passionate about his work, careful about his research, and a very fine writer, all qualities that made 
not only for a good lawyer, but made him the good person that I remember, end quote. The Honorable Gail Chang Bohr, still here, was also a classmate and remembers, and a fellow law review editor, remembers the same characteristics in Phil, along with his fondness for cowboy boots. <laughs> While he was a student at Mitchell, Phil published a note in the law review in which he examined the racial disparities in the ease of convictions and the harshness in sentencings related to crack cocaine as compared to other drugs as well as more serious crimes. He argued these disparities were contrary to the imperative in all criminal prosecutions, which is that justice shall be done. Phil's view was vindicated the following year in State versus Russell when the Minnesota Supreme Court, citing Phil's article, struck down the offending statute as a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the state's Constitution. Justice Rosalie Wall wrote, there comes a time when we cannot and must not close our eyes when presented with evidence that certain laws, regardless of the purpose for which they were enacted, discriminate unfairly on the basis of race. This was the beginning of Phil's career in the law during which he refused to close his eyes to injustice and worked indefatigably to protect his, to protect his client. All children whose husband had died in a workplace accident, understand how she could navigate workers' compensation and social security benefits to allow her to keep their home. Al married his high school sweetheart, Jean Lauderman Levine, in 1949, and they were married until the time of his death for almost 72 years. He was a devoted father to his son, Steve, and his daughter, Carol, he enjoyed going to Viking, Gopher, Twins games with them, spending time with his five grandchildren, collecting contemporary art, and traveling the world with his family. Just as Albert followed in the footsteps of his father in becoming a lawyer, he was very proud of the fact that both his son, Stephen, and his son-in-law, Alan Shapiro, became lawyers and members of the State Bar Association. Albert was an outstanding lawyer and a role model for his family and to all who knew and worked with him. He will be sorely missed, but his memory will always be cherished. Respectfully submitted, Stephen Levine, Carol Shapiro, and Marvin List. Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Eric Levy. I'm here to deliver a memorial for my father. Uh, Ivan Miles Levy passed away on, excuse me, January 26, 2021, after a more than 12 month battle with pancreatic cancer. I'm honored to give this memorial of him to the Ramsey County Bar. Ivan was born and grew up in a Jewish home in New York City as the oldest of three children. In 1972, he traveled to the other side of the country to attend the University of Oregon. At Oregon, Ivan was a triple major in political science, mathematics, and secondary education. He also met Mary Rice, whom he would marry in 1976. The couple moved to Grand Forks, North Dakota, so that Mary could obtain her master's degree in speech pathology. They subsequently moved to the Twin Cities so that Ivan could attend the University of Minnesota Law School. He graduated in 1981, having taken great pride in paying for both his college and law degrees by himself. After graduating from law school, Ivan joined the Henretta Law Firm, headed by Bob Henretta. Ivan described working with Bob as Bob would do all the important stuff, and I would do the paperwork and cleanup. <laughs> Eventually, he would become more involved with clients, and on October 1st, 1989, Ivan accepted an offer to be the general counsel of Interplastic Corporation. That was the job he held continuously for the remainder of his life. 
I even loved his work as a general counsel. He was the type of person who loved a new challenge or a new topic to research and learn about. And so the life of a general counsel fit him perfectly. During the decades when increasing specialization within the legal profession became the norm, Ivan was the rare attorney who was not only asked to be proficient in dozens of legal areas, he actually was proficient in them. He enjoyed tax regulation as much as labor law. He enjoyed drafting contracts as much as drafting briefs. He argued successfully before several state and federal judges as well as before the Minnesota Court of Appeals. Outside of work, Ivan was exceptionally generous of his time and talents with family and friends. There was never a request for his assistance that was turned down. More often, the assistance he offered exceeded the expectations of the requester by orders of magnitude. Ivan was more than happy to assist family members with estate planning questions, or to offer business management assistance, or review a contract that a family member was struggling with. Because Ivan loved teaching, he would dive headfirst into these issues and get himself well-versed in details that seemed irrelevant at the time, but all came together at the end as Ivan explained the situation in painstaking detail. Ivan loved spending time with his growing family. The family always loved sports, and Ivan always said yes to any invitation to a game. Ivan and his youngest son visited a new Major League Baseball stadium every year a trip they both looked forward to many months in advance. He loved watching shows at the Guthrie with his wife. He was immensely proud of all four of his children and their accomplishments, and he adored spending time with his two young grandchildren. Ivan's diagnosis with pancreatic cancer was a shock, as he had no other significant ailments. He approached the diagnosis with the same zeal to learn, educate, and advise that he approached everything else in life. He was never upset about life dealing him this card. He ordered his family not to be lugubrious about the situation because Ivan always loved a $5 word. <laughs> Instead, he penned profound updates on his journey, his amazement at the wonders of his life, and the many thanks that he had. Everyone who received these updates learned a great deal about how to approach the uncertainty that comes with the end of one's life. Ivan will be remembered for his quick wit, his voracious appetite for knowledge. And this amazing intellect he will be missed by all who had the joy of knowing him. Excuse me. <sighs> Respectfully submitted, Eric Levy. Thank you. May it please the court, counsel, honored guests. My name is Jerry Hendrickson, and it's my privilege to present the memorial for my good friend, John B. McCormick. John was born and raised in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and graduated from high school there. He received his bachelor's degree from Purdue University and his law degree from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He began his law career as a public defender at the Menominee Reservation near Shawano, Wisconsin, starting a lifelong commitment to public service. After a short time there, he came to the Twin Cities and became an assistant city attorney for the city of St. Paul. He started as a criminal prosecutor for the city. Over a 36-year career, he served in many capacities, including deputy city attorney, and interim city attorney. He's most remembered for his years representing the city in labor law matters. Through intelligence, hard work, and a deep commitment to the city's interests, 
John became a highly capable and highly respected lawyer. His advice was sought by mayors, city council members, police chiefs, and other leaders of city government. He was a confidant for many city attorneys, not only because of his knowledge of the law, but because he understood people and had a strong sense of justice. During his tenure, many major city projects benefited from his input. John loved his work and loved the law, but the law was only one part of his life. He was a recognized authority on duck decoys and spear fishing gear, having large collections of both. Every fall, he went duck hunting with friends and in-laws. He loved sports of all kinds and had a large music collection. He spent many hours guarding, gardening as well. As might be expected from someone who grew up in Green Bay, John was an avid Green Bay Packers fan. He and his family had season tickets his whole life. One of his proudest stories was about how, when in high school, he sold programs at the Ice Bowl. For those of you not familiar with this, it was the 1967 National Football League championship game played at Lambeau Field in Green Bay. At the time of the game, the air temperature was 15 degrees below zero, with a wind chill of 48 below zero. John suffered with his beloved Packers, who defeated the Dallas Cowboys for the league championship. His greatest love and greatest joy was his family. He met Bridget Spurl of St. Paul when he moved to the Twin Cities. They married in 1981 and raised three children, Claire, Sheila, and Jack. John was a devoted father and husband. When Claire married Ben Closel and had two children, Luke and Amalia, John became a devoted grandfather as well. John and Bridget traveled the world together. John was a good friend. He was funny, curious, irreverent, and deeply loyal. He was fun to be around, and to meet him was to like him. He was deeply missed. Respectfully submitted Frank William, Terry Garvey, Eric Larson, and myself. May it please the court. I'm Lisa Brabbit, and it is my honor. To present this memorial on behalf of my dad, Joel Montpennant. My dad passed away peacefully after navigating Parkinson's disease for 16 years. With my mom's dedicated care and support and his faith in God's plan, he lived comfortably at home and without complaint in the final years of his life. He was born in St. Paul to Warren and Elizabeth Mompettit. He graduated from Creighton High School in 1961 and received his BA from St. John's University in 1965 and earned his law degree from William Mitchell College of Law in 1969. I am well on my way to never memorializing any other family member in my family. <laughs> I am pretty sure. My dad loved the law and understood the practice to be a true honor and a privilege. He was the founding partner of his firm in South St. Paul, Montpettit, Freeling, and Kranz, and served clients with distinction. 
For much of his career, he focused on plaintiff's personal injury cases, but did a wide variety of things with his law degree. He also served as general counsel for Chris Craft Boat Company and Don Z Marine out of Sarasota, Florida. At his core, he was a relationship builder and a connector. He generously shared his talents and invested in people. Civility, kindness, and humor, much humor, were non-negotiable aspects of his engagement with others, and he found the greatest return on his life energy knowing he made a difference for someone else. He was a leader in the community, coaching youth hockey for over a decade, serving as two-time president of the Woodbury Athletic Association, president and lead fundraiser for the Hillmarie Brewster Club. He also promoted professional boxing, an endeavor that earned him a spot in the Mancini's Sports Hall of Fame. I suspect several in this room attended some of those cards. He was a behind-the-scenes influencer for a number of organizations, events, and programs. My dad had no shortage of hobbies, and boating on the St. Croix River was top of the list. In 1988, he was the lead founder of the Bayport Marina Association, and in 2000, he served as the association's commodore. The marina was a place he loved and home to his Chris Craft 410 commander, the sorceress. He thoroughly enjoyed hosting guests on his boat, usually legal professionals and court staff, and he entertained with his quick wit and one-liners. He also enjoyed history, skiing, Harleys, good music, travel, filling bird feeders, and quiet evenings on his porch. He was a diehard Johnny and rarely missed a football game. In 1984, he worked with coach Gagliardi and Don Riley, longtime Pioneer Press sports columnist, to publish the book Gagliardi, The Coach, The Man, The Legend. My dad took tremendous pride in his family. He and my mom celebrated 56 years of marriage before passing. And together they had four kids. Me, my brother Todd, my brother Jeff, also a lawyer, and my sister Amy. He also adored his uh, sons and daughter, daughters-in-law like his own, my husband Bob, my brother's wife Susan, my brother's wife Karen, and my sister's husband Jeff. He adored his... I might not even be invited back at this point. <laughs> he adored his nine grandchildren, Emily, Allie, Isabel, Anna, Lucas, Olivia, Logan, Carson, and Ella. His extensive and diverse social circles brought him endless joy and positive energy. And he leaves behind a considerable legacy to the thousands of lives he touched. May it please the court, my name is Michael Black, and it is my honor to present the memorial on behalf of Catherine Burke Moore. Kathy was born on February 16, 1955 in St. Paul and was the third of four children born to Alice and James Burke. She was raised in White Bear Lake and received a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Wisconsin at River Falls in 1977, majoring in elementary education. Kathy then spent six years teaching grade school in Wisconsin and Minnesota before deciding to return to school. She began working uh, toward a master's degree in public administration before turning her focus to law school. Kathy earned her law degree from the William Mitchell College of Law in 1988. After graduating from William Mitchell, Kathy started a career with the state of Minnesota that ultimately spanned over 20 years, most of which 
was spent with several divisions of the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. She began her post-law school career as an administrative rules coordinator for the commissioner of the department. In less than two years, she became the director of driver and vehicle services, a division of the Department of Public Safety. Kathy became the assistant director to the Office of Traffic Safety in 1998, where she served for 10 years. In 2008, Kathy became the executive director of the Emergency Medical Services Regulatory Board, a position she held for three years. In her career with the Minnesota Department of Public Safety, she served to reduce motor vehicle crashes, deaths, and inquiries on Minnesota's roadways with a particular focus on increasing seatbelt use and getting impaired drivers off the roads. She testified in front of state Senate and House committees to work for the passage of the 0.08 blood alcohol content level for impaired drivers and developed a reputation among members of the state legislature for being a reliable and knowledgeable source on traffic safety questions and statistics. She served as the public safety lead in developing and completing the nation's first comprehensive highway safety plan in conjunction with the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Kathy's work, along with the work of her colleagues over the years, contributed to keeping all Minnesotas safe or on the roads. Throughout much of her career, Kathy was also a member of the American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators, a voluntary association representing the motor vehicle administrators and law, chief law enforcement officials in North America, an organization in which she held several positions, including vice chair and chair of the board. Among her notable achievements and true to her reputation of being able to recall and present reliable information, as chair of that board, she testified in front of the United States House Committee on Ways and Means on the use of social security numbers by state DMVs. While her career and professional accomplishments made her a giant in her field, it is impossible to fully honor her life and who she was without mentioning how she achieved those accomplishments as a woman devoted to her family. Kathy married her husband Cliff in 1984 and together they raised three children, Jameson, Libby, and Riley. Almost as if she had the ability to be in four places at once, she never missed an opportunity to help with homework or attend sports events, band concerts, and dance recitals of her three children. She packed bagged lunches with original cartoon drawings on the bags and put dinner on the table virtually every night. On an average day, she had a to-do to list of almost impossible scale that she completed at a, with a high level of care and attention every single day. She was the best wife, mother, and grandmother her family could ask for, and it is not lost on them that she showed this same dedication to her career and all of the personal and professional connections she made along the way. <coughs> Excuse me. She was fully present with you no matter what your relationship to her, and she deeply cherished her friends and family in the joy they, let, they brought to her life. In 2013, Kathy was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's, the disease that eventually took her life. Despite this diagnosis, she fought to hold onto her buoyant sense of humor, brilliant mind, kind-heartedness, and resilient sense of self for as long as she possibly could. She passed away on January 29, 2021. She is survived by her husband, Cliff, daughter Libby, who's married to Dan, sons Jameson, and Riley, who's also an attorney practicing in Illinois, uh, who's married to Jana. Her grandchildren, Frederick, Weston, Nettie, Carter, and Harlan, and her Tom, excuse me, her brother Tom and sister Liz also survive her. While Kathy left us too soon, she gave more to those around her in one lifetime than anyone could hope to give in multiple. And for that, her family is far better off and eternally grateful. Respectfully submitted by Riley C. Moore.
May it please the court. I have the honor of presenting this memorial of Holly Jean Newman on behalf of the Newman family. Is he here? Oh, I'm sorry. May it please the court, council, honored guests. My name is Scott Newman. My daughter-in-law, Holly Newman, was born on August 30th, 1971. She died on November 24th, 2020. Holly was taken too soon by the scourge that is cancer. Her family and, uh, and clients miss her terribly. Ensuring the success of her family and her clients were her priorities. She did this with incredible strength, drive, and dedication. Holly was a true believer and epitome of success coming from hard work. By the time she was 20 and while working full time, Holly earned two undergraduate degrees, degrees with high distinction from the University of Minnesota Morris. She moved on immediately to the William Mitchell College of Law where she graduated magna cum laude and continued to work full time and started a family. She graduated from law school while on bed rest with her first son. Her professional career began shortly thereafter and she worked tirelessly with her clients. Her desire to advocate for her clients brought her admissions to the United States Court of Appeals, United States District Court, Minnesota, North Dakota, and Wisconsin, and the state Supreme Courts in Minnesota, North Dakota, and Wisconsin. She maintained law licenses in Minnesota, North Dakota, and Wisconsin. And while humble in her personal successes, Holly took great, great pride in working hard and advocating for her clients and family. Some of her biggest smiles came from a simple thank you note from a client. She shed true tears of joy as her sons grew to adulthood. Her true, her true strength and grace came to light during her battle with cancer. She was diagnosed in October, to, October 2017. The cancer had already metastasized and there was no cure. She took the news, set a battle plan, and dug in for a protracted war. I for her family and advocates and for her clients. Their progress and motivation for her got her through the treatment, surgeries, and dark days. It brought me more time with her. Holly died on November 24, 2020. She is survived by her mother, sister, two sons, and a loving husband. We lost a wonderful family champion. The legal profession lost a brilliant mind and an unparalleled client advocate, re respectfully submitted by her husband, Lance Newman. Good afternoon, may it please the court. I'm Michael Rowley. I have the honor of presenting this memorial in remembrance of my father, Stephen Rowley. 
Steve Rowley was born in Madison, Wisconsin on January 8, 1943, the second child and first son of Gilbert and Geraldine Rowley. He graduated from the University of St. Thomas in 1965 with a political science major, followed by a law degree from the University of Wisconsin in 1968. Then began his 33-year career as a corporate attorney with the 3M Office of General Counsel, where he was Assistant General Counsel and Assistant Secretary. In his final two years at 3M, he served as the General Counsel at Dynean, a subsidiary of 3M. In that position, he traveled to China many times, doing something he truly loved, becoming immersed in a country, its people, and its culture. Serving as a pro bono attorney for parents adopting children from other countries, Korea, Vietnam, and India, for example, was a true labor of love and his favorite of all his pro bono cases. Using his legal skills to join adoptive parents and children was a source of tremendous joy and satisfaction. Most of all, my dad cherished his home and family, attending sports and school events, generously and enthusiastically hosting family gatherings, working on remodeling projects at his home and those of his children. He was proud that his three sons followed him in obtaining legal training and that his daughter established a counseling practice to balance out and keep the legal mind sane. <laughs> Steve's love of music, especially played at a thunderous volume while he was working around the house, ran the gamut from rock and roll to classic music of all, classical music of all kinds, and especially to opera. Steve will be remembered for his love of life, his enthusiasm, optimism, his generous spirit, and his sense of humor, which never left him even through his declining health. Steve is survived by his wife, Trish Bowen Rowley, their three sons, Michael, David, and Christopher, and daughter, Sarah Barrett, and seven grandchildren, Nathan and Carolyn, Christian, Thomas, and Benjamin, and Joseph and Lizzie. Thank you. May it please the court. My name is Paul Anderson, and it's my honor and privilege today to present the memorial on behalf of my friend, law school classmate, and legal colleague, Alan Weinblatt. Alan William Weinblatt graduated from the University of Minnesota Law School in 1968. And after he finished law school, he clerked for federal judge uh, Philip Neville. And they formed a very close relationship, so close that the judge and his family asked Alan to speak at the judge's funeral. After the clerkship, Alan joined the law firm of Altman, uh, Garrity, Leonard, and Mullally. And then after that, for one year, he went out with uh, Dick Leonard in the practice of law. His first case was a bankruptcy case where he got paid with a bag of tomatoes and a bucket of onions. <laughs> that client stayed with him for 45 years and subsequently paid him in cash. <laughs> Allen is most noted for his work with the Minnesota uh, DFL party. He became famous for his work on reapportionment for five decades, 1970, 80, 90, 2000, and 2010. He also represented many Democratic uh, candidates in uh, election recounts. And Judge Debit once asked Allen, he said, Allen, have you memorized the Minnesota statutes on election law? And Allen's response was said, honestly, Your Honor, I have. <laughs> he had that kind of a mind. Anyway, is that Allen not only being a good lawyer, he mentored any number of new uh, lawyers, and he brought them along the way so they could learn from him and watch how he did things. Many of them went on to be great lawyers. Allen liked to help people. 
And I'll tell you one story that illustrates this point. He represented Royal Zeno, did it pro bono against the Minnesota Airports Commission. Zeno and five members of his partners ran the Sushines operation at the airport. Well, the airport commission, this wisdom, decided that they would put him out of business. So Zeno went to his good friend Alan and said, can you help? Alan promised he'd do something. So what did Alan do? He called a local DJ. And he said, would you put on your uh, show and ask the audience to call into the Minneapolis St. Paul Airports Commission and complain about this injustice because they're going to put these people out of work and they're wind up on welfare. Three days, the computers and phone lines at the airport were overwhelmed. Not only that, Tom Brokaw from NBC News came out and did a story. People Magazine did a story about Zeno. And they filmed at the airport about what the airport was doing about these uh, people who wanted to make an earn a living, honest living, shining shoes at the airport. Long story short, Allen negotiated a five-year contract for them to remain at the airport. And to this day, those shoe shines shores are operated by Zeno's daughter. Now, loyalty was important to Alan. His longtime, he said secretary, he started out, but really a legal assistant, worked with him from 1968 to 2021. After she had been with him for 25 years, he put out a full page ad in the local bar uh, magazine honoring her for all the work that she'd done. And he said, you know, she was more than just a secretary a legal assistant. She deserved to have a law degree. Many of you don't know that uh, he represented easy many stories. And as a result of that, he basically has written the laws in the state of Minnesota with respect to many storage facilities. Now, Allen was a Renaissance man. At age 68, he started a new business, College Advisors Network. It was a business where he advised students and their parents about schools throughout the country. And he was very, very good at it. And it amazed with his knowledge and his ability and success. success. And it continues today as a business by those who uh, worked with him at that time. Now, Alan liked to travel, but he, he couldn't not combine his recreation of travel with a little bit of business. For example, in 1980, he and wife Gloria went to Russia to see Russia, but he brought along a number of visas and citizenship papers for Russian Jews so that they could move to Israel and become Israeli citizens. Now, Alan, born in St. Paul, father of four children, and he instilled in the children a love for travel and knowledge. Children, Melinda, Tanya, Adam, and Shay, uh, one of his sons was a, almost a world-class musician, a magician, but he liked to brag about that. But anyway, he would, uh, his kids would describe life with Alan was a big adventure. Seven grandchildren who he loved dearly, typical of Alan, late in life, he learned how to swim so he could go in the swimming pool and enjoy his children, grandchildren as they swam. Alan loved the theater, reading, listening, traveling, and this is absolutely true. As a kid, he read Collier's encyclopedia through cover to cover, A to Z, three different times. <laughs> and I must add here that Alan had a brilliant, brilliant mind. It was a gift. He was one of the brightest people I ever knew, but Here's the important thing about Alan. You know, we all know these super bright people. Often they don't let the rest of us catch up. They're impatient, and they come across as arrogant. Alan wasn't like that. He had the patience and humility to let the rest of us catch up with him. I am very honored to say that Alan Weinblatt was my law school classmate, legal colleague, 
and a friend. This memorial submitted by his beloved wife, Gloria Weinblatt. We should make a practice of always ending these with Justice Anderson. <laughs> we are honored that you shared your stories and your memories of your loved ones and your colleagues. Uh, on behalf of the Ramsey County Bench in the 2nd Judicial District, uh, thank you. Now we will call the session to a close. We lost a sheet, but um, coming to a close. Session is closed. <laughs>